I think this video is going to be really interesting, guys, because since AMD launched their Ryzen 6000 series into the laptop market, one question kept coming into my head, and of course, in the common threads of every single laptop video that we posted, is the Ryzen 6000 H series really all that much better than the 5000 H series? Well, it's a pretty important thing to answer, especially right now uh, when a lot of last year's models have some insane discounts, while the brand new stuff is going for a premium, uh, even though a lot of the time they have almost identical specs. But anyways, let's talk about how I'm gonna go about testing these two CPU series against one another. Basically, apples to apples testing on laptops is almost impossible for a ton of reasons. Most of it is because of the chassis design improvements, uh, component power, and a ton of other variable changes from one generation to the next. But not with this thing, because this right over here is the Flow X13. It's actually one of my favorite laptops from last year, and it's been carried over to 2022 pretty much unchanged other than just one big thing. It's been switched from a Ryzen 9 5980HS with DDR4 to AMD's new Ryzen 9 6800HS with DDR5. I mean, sure, our new sample comes with the shiny new RTX 3050 Ti instead of the GTX 1650, but that doesn't really matter because this thing is still compatible with the XG mobile dock that rocks an RTX 3080. So I can use both X13s with the exact same GPU. It's almost the perfect setup for this kind of testing, and I'm excited to share the results. But what about those CPU differences that I'm trying to test? Well, the changes between the 6900HS and the 5980HS are pretty minimal, at least on paper. Technically, the newer CPU should run at consistently higher frequencies since its power management is quite a bit better. Other than that, the biggest change is probably the jump from Vega to RDNA2 graphics, but that won't really factor into this equation anyways, since both laptops are equipped with discrete GPUs. But I think some of the biggest changes come a bit further under the hood, and they could actually be more important than just a simple clock speed bump. We're talking about a move from PCI Gen 3 to PCI Gen 4 SSDs, support for USB 4 through a future software update, uh, Wi-Fi 6E instead of Wi-Fi 6, and simply more connectivity options if a manufacturer chooses to take advantage of them. Now, speaking of SSDs, did you know that this year marks the 35th anniversary of NAND flash memory? From the first use of flash memory until now, Kyoxix technologies have been there pushing the limits of what's possible, from the evolution of hard drives to SSDs, from CDs to MP3 players and smartphones, or from camera film to SD cards, They've been there every step of the way. And today, Kyoxi's SSDs with Bix 3D flash memory are some of the most exciting stuff yet. There's the BG5 that packs an incredible amount of space into a tiny and efficient footprint, the CD7, which pushes the absolute bleeding edge for data centers with a PCI Gen 5 interface that offers double the bandwidth when compared to a Gen 4 drive. And of course, there's the XD6, an SSD that might look like a regular M.2 drive, but it's completely hot swappable. If you want to know more about Keoxia and how they're continuing to offer some of the most exciting storage solutions around, head to the link down in the description below. All right, back to the new Flow X13. And another thing I want to quickly add is that they've also added a higher bandwidth link between the CPU and GPU, which could impact the performance of higher-end GPUs like the RTX 3080. ASUS has also taken this update as a time to upgrade the screen to a 500 nit display from just 300 nits before. They also upgraded the webcam and they also decided to toss in a MUX switch. Nice job, ASUS. But other than that, the X13 still has the exact same design from last year. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the most important thing. And that's how this new laptop behaves versus the previous one. Now I'm gonna focus purely on performance mode here. And the 6900HS sips back around one watt more on average, but it also runs 200 megahertz faster on average under an all core workload. While doing that, it also runs a bit hotter, but that's probably due to the fact that ASUS has made performance mode quieter at the same time. So it looks like mission accomplished, so far. So let's see how that shakes out into actual benchmarks. And I'll be throwing in a few other laptops just for the fun of it. Let's start with some battery life. And right away, I think there's some explanation to do. While Zen 3 Plus might not boast a massive clock speed uplift, there's been a ton of changes under the hood to reduce power consumption, especially during idle and low load scenarios. Some of AMD's own docs actually mention we should be seeing up to 50% better battery life in these situations. 
Of course, the lower power states of LPDDR5 and the RTX 3050 Ti's more advanced idle configuration could also make a pretty big impact here as well. But either way, this is a huge advantage for AMD right now, especially for the thinner light market, this full X13 plays in really well. When we switch to a full core load, you can actually see how laser targeted this power saving mode really is because there's literally no effect here. But speaking of higher loads, let's check out how actual real world performance plays out too. And right away, Citibench shows the benefits of running at a consistently higher frequency for longer periods of time. What I wasn't expecting was a difference in single threaded programs, but it's certainly there with the newer chip leading the way by a thin margin. It can come close to anything based on Auto Lake, but that was to be expected. Moving on to Blender, and what you're seeing here is pretty much gonna hold true for the rest of the results. That small clock speed bump AMD gave to this new generation allows it to achieve marginal but measurable improvements over last year's CPUs. And that sort of makes sense since Zen 3 Plus is simply a small evolutionary step before the real star of the show arrives later this year with Zen 4. But you do have to ask yourself, if everything else was the same, including the GPU, amount of memory and storage, would you really want to pay a premium for such a small and not huge noticeable performance bump? Well, a much longer test like our Maya render might change your mind if CPU focused workloads are something that you need to get done. Because of the 6900HS's better long-term clock speed consistency, its gap just gets wider and wider as time continues. Now, just for fun, I just wanted to see what kind of performance you could expect from this 2022 model when its RTX 3050 Ti is compared against the GTX 1650 from last year. So if you look at GPU accelerated rendering and even with the faster CPU playing to its advantage, the new X13's RTX 3050 Ti holds a bit of an advantage in resolve, but switch over to Premiere Pro and they're essentially getting the exact same results. Switching to frame rates, well, those aren't even close, but I didn't expect them to be since, look, even when operating at about the same power limit, the RTX 3050 Ti is in a completely different league than the GTX 1650. But just take into account that the 2022 X13 is still available with the 1650 or even integrated graphics. All right, so I think it's time to kick things into high gear for gaming and content creation by adding the XG mobile dock. Because remember, this thing runs its RTX 3080 at a constant 125 watts, making it one of the fastest mobile GPU solutions available for laptops. And you can actually see that when GPUs are equal, NLEs like Resolve and Premiere don't really benefit all that much from CPU performance at this level. So the changes from one Zen architecture to the next will be virtually non-existent here. And when it comes to actual gaming at a normally CPU limited 1080p resolution, it's absolutely impossible to distinguish the 6900HS from the 5980HS. The only small bump in performance is in CSGO, which sees about an 8% increase in frame rates. But one of the main benefits of using the dock is the ability to push your display to a larger, high-resolution external monitor. And at 1440p, the margins get even smaller, even in CSGO, since the GPU itself becomes more of a bottleneck than the processor. Now, this is something ultra important to remember when you're looking at gaming laptops with 1440p and above screens. The CPU really does take a backseat. And that's even more apparent at 4K, where the CPU choice matters even less. It's almost too bad that so many manufacturers pair up their high-end GPUs with the very best processors, because I'm sure you'd get similar results with something like a Ryzen 5 6600H. And no, I'm not kidding, guys. So in the end, the choice between buying a previous generation gaming laptop and one with a shiny new Ryzen 6000 series CPU is gonna be a tough choice, because from a raw CPU performance standpoint, there isn't really any reason you should spend more money to buy the latest and greatest, especially if both laptops have the exact same GPU because the gaming results are virtually the same. So laptops based on the 5000 series are pretty tempting given their reduced prices. But I think the decision about whether or not to buy one will ultimately come down to how much value you place on battery life. So if your laptop's gonna be plugged in, then go ahead, save some money. But if you're gonna be regularly using it away from a charger, um, then absolutely, the new CPUs are a no-brainer. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. I hope you were able to take away something from this comparison between Ryzen 6000 H series and Ryzen 5000 series. Um, let us know what you guys think. I'm Ibar with Harvard Canucks. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you guys 
in the next one. Spend responsibly, by the way. Okay, I can cut now. <laughs>